Hello everybody, it's Chris Ashcroft here, publisher of Cruise Insight magazine. I thought I'd let you know that last week I was asked to create a video summarising my thoughts about the cruise industry for use during a webinar in Barcelona. Its popularity as an instigator of debate was such that I have been persuaded to make it more widely available. My brief was supposedly quite simple to talk about the recovery of the cruise industry and how long it will take. Well, <laughs> as you will imagine and can imagine, uh, that's not so easy after all, is it? Uh, almost impossible. But I have some interesting ideas to provoke discussion amongst yourselves uh, about the recovery, what it may look like, and something about the complex issues that need to be solved before a resumption of cruising is possible. Let me start though by telling you that these are my personal views and not those of the cruise companies who are reluctant to talk specifically about what may or may not happen in the future and who can blame them. Perhaps a good way of illustrating how the industry has changed so quickly let me first show you the cover of Cruise Insight from the last quarter of last year, where we talk about stagnation. We believed, and the industry believed, and the experts believed, that without new and extra capacity at the shipyards, the industry would stagnate. Then just a few months later, to March 2020, and I've devoted the front cover, the whole cover, to what Richard Fain had to say. And he talks about to be in a position to move forward at a fast pace when the pandemic is finished. Well, we are where we are, and we are, are in this perilous state right now. So what is the reality? It is that Carnival Corporation, the largest of the major groups with nine brands and over 100 cruise ships, as many of you know, is said to be losing $1 billion per month. That's right, $1 billion per month. All the major cruise line groups are faced with huge losses. Their only objective right now can be summed up in one simple word. Survival. And so they have immediately cut operational expenses and capital costs. Royal Caribbean is laying off or furloughing around 1,400 of its 5,000 US-based workers. Norwegian has reduced its U.S. employees' shoreside pay by 20% and moved to a four-day week. Carnival Corporation has yet to make any specific announcement, but I suspect they may choose this moment to further consolidate the management of their brands, thereby cutting costs. I haven't heard from MSC Cruises either, but I'm pretty sure they are doing similar things across their offices around the world. As for new ship deliveries, they're going to be delayed until around 2023-2024, according to Mayor Verf Managing Director Thomas Wiegand. The multi-billion dollar ship refurbishment programs that have become such an integral part of the industry's strategy over recent years have been abandoned completely as has the building of new terminals and the investment in new private islands and destinations. They've all come to a halt. That is simply because what I said before is their priority, survival. And I'm not clear who are, most, who are the most vulnerable, but I believe there will be casualties. This is presumably why cruise lines have not been in touch with the ports to explain what is happening. In reality, there are about 600 ports and 200 governments the cruise industry will have to deal with 
before a resumption of global cruising is possible. This begins with the major hub ports in the Mediterranean, in the Northern Europe, in Caribbean, in America and Alaska, in Australia, in Asia, in the Middle East, everywhere. It begins with the major hub ports. Those of you who have cruised will know that you will have to sign a piece of paper prior to embarkation, which states that you have, or you don't have, I should say, any medical conditions that the cruise line should be concerned about. Clearly, that is no longer acceptable. A protocol will have to be agreed for embarking passengers at the start of a cruise. What can be put in place to guarantee that all passengers embarking a cruise ship are free from COVID-19? In Asia, thermal imaging for temperature screening has been in place for 10 years. But that's not good enough. Cruise lines will also have to put in place a protocol for crew members. The last thing they want is for their passengers to find themselves infected by a crew member on board ship. The finger prick antibody test introduced by MarTech in answer to EU and IMO guidelines is being used by some ship operators to screen crew members from, for symptoms of COVID-19. The result from that test, though, takes 10 minutes to deliver. But increasing numbers of scientists have now declared that antibody tests do not prove someone is protected from infection. It doesn't prove it. In the end, there will have to be a solution that uses technology to ensure that there is a reasonably speedy embarkation process for passengers embarking cruise ships. But it doesn't stop there, as a cruise includes ports of call, as we all know. Number one, it doesn't matter where the cruise is. Very often, most often, the port of call and the port of call after that are located in different countries. So will each port of call allow the cruise ship into port, number one. Number two, which will each port of call be testing each passenger for the virus? Will they? And when passengers go ashore, will any of them be infected with COVID-19 and then return to ship with it? These are complex issues to solve and will have to involve national governments before any resumption of cruise ship operations. And I haven't even mentioned airlines and airports, the ramifications for that industry, which has been so aligned with the cruise product. That is why, to begin with, I believe flights will be avoided and ships will start to operate out of drive to home ports. This will benefit single nationality brands the most. Brands who carry multiple nationalities might find they are more difficult to get on board, but that remains to be seen. And so perhaps the German followed by the British markets will start to recover first. What about what of the cruise lines? They will choose their most efficient ships to operate those that historically have the best return on investment. That is because it will be a huge challenge to make a profit. What prices will they offer? Will they sail deliberately at half capacity? Or will they be forced to sail at half capacity? Will they sail at break even? These are some of the reasons why I believe they may begin with shorter cruises. But nobody knows when cruises will restart anywhere. And nobody can say how the cruise experience itself may be different on land or at sea. Or which brands will start first? Will it be the brands that target the younger demographic? Or will it be 
multiple cruisers who love the product that will drive demand for their favourite brand. It has been said that the smaller ships and expedition ships will suffer the least as the passengers are extremely conscientious and will respect social distancing and be respectful of the rules. They do not go on a cruise to party. We, we all know that. And they say that the big ship companies are at a disadvantage. But of course, because they are big, they have more financial muscle, so can withstand the crisis longer. I believe that unless there is a breakthrough in the development of a vaccine, it is overly optimistic to expect half the world's fleet of cruise ships to be operating by the end of the year, as some people have suggested. My hunch is that the cruise industry is going to find it difficult to get back to anywhere near normality for at least a year, if not longer. And then it will be a slow and gradual increase in the number of ships starting operations. Having said that, as we all know, consumers have a short memory. So the sooner a vaccine is discovered, the sooner we will see many more ships and the big ships back in operation. That is the key to the health of this industry and also, of course, to the world economy. But there is a glimmer of hope. Teams of scientists all over the world are working tirelessly to find a vaccine that will prevent us from catching the virus. There are around five human trials for COVID-19 vaccine that have started around the world. There are two in Britain where there is very real optimism for a positive outcome. If either prove successful, the vaccine will be mass produced and rolled out across Britain and the formula made available free of charge to all governments around the world. We have to hope for that kind of a solution from wherever it comes and it doesn't matter where it comes from. That's what I have to say about the industry as we sit here today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something from it. I hope you can take something away from it. Above all, be safe and thank you for watching.